Good evening. Is capitalism actually destroying democracy? Wow. Okay, <laughs> Jennifer. <laughs> Um, that's, that's a very philosophical I know, it's, it's, it's always <laughs> the simple questions that open up the biggest conversation. But I think, um, I would say, you know, capitalism takes on in many different forms and the way the capitalist system has evolved over the last many centuries, where we are now, you know, the, our workers, the people who work in different sectors, um, why is it? that our educators, those who work in nursing homes, are paid the least when they are looking after mm. the most vulnerable um, or our children, who are their future. So I think there's some perverse effects in capitalism, but I think um, Sharon Burrow will probably have a more articulate answer. <laughs> so, so I will come to Sharon in just a minute, but Damien, you just came back from the United States, and there we are seeing all of this playing out, aren't we? That yeah. you, know, you see the rampant capitalism, it's the home of democracy, but we saw the protesters trashing the, the, the yeah. Capitol building. Um, there is this all the institutional rot that yeah. you talked about before and the, the tensions within the country. What does it say about the capacity for democracy to endure and capitalism to deliver? You know, I think it's capitalism is probably too broad a category, mm. but one of the things that I did see in the United States that I think is not just apparent there, it's a growing problem in Australia too, is the power of inequality. The power of economic inequality to separate and, and create cleavages in society that are not healthy for democracy. And so in the United States, you have people who are not only divided by political party, they're increasingly divided by class, by belief, by style. Some what Republican Party will wear Wranglers, Democrats will wear Levi's. I mean, it's the, the cleavages are so deep. Mm. And, and yet we know statistically, and there's studies that have just come out recently showing that one of the keys to upward mobility is that you put people of different classes together. In the United States for a long time, in a lot of democracies, that was just a given. That's how it was. But unfortunately, late stage capitalism, without guardrails and, and enough of a fight against inequality, creates systems where people people just divide. And I think America's suffering those divisions right and now. And Sharon, how, how much of a threat to democracy globally is inequality? Oh, well, let me start with the model of economy. The global model of economy has failed working people. There's no doubt about that. I, even in the region we live in, or our country lives in, I don't at the moment, then 94% uh, of the workforce in the global supply chains are a hidden workforce. And it's been based on a model where, in fact, you exploited labour in order to, uh, to make maximum profits. And we've seen the growth of billionaires that is just incomprehensible. But when you look at why that is, Stan, a couple of things. Since the 1980s, the social contract's been broken. We've quadrupled our wealth, but we've seen labour income share go down mm. like a, a big dipper and a roller coaster, and people are in despair. You heard Jennifer talk about why we don't distribute our wealth better, pay the people we depend on. COVID showed us that. It was, of course, those in healthcare, in childcare, in education, in transport, logistics, retail. They're amongst the lowest paid and the majority of women. And that is about inequality. But we also need governments to step up and look at their responsibility for a rules-based order nationally and internationally, where we again regulate. We regulate labour markets, we regulate competition. If you look at the inflationary spikes right now in food, then you have about four companies globally controlling food production and distribution, despite all the millions of poor farmers. Mm. And the Cargill family, for example, 70% of control of that food, 12 new billionaires and a profit last year that was the largest in its, uh, its 156-year um, history, and, in fact, more will be this year. And they're not alone. I just picked them out because if you look at the nine new billionaires from the pharmaceutical companies in the US alone during COVID, and, in fact, uh, when America invested a lot of its own capital, as did other uh, taxpayers' money, as did other countries, but didn't hold any IP so we could get rid of the insidious mm. uh, vaccine so, nationalism. You know, we've, we've got things out of whack, Stan, and I think unless people are prepared, and uh, indeed Damien said it, look at reform of the multilateral system, but also come back and regulate the labour market. Our labour market is broken. 
60% of the world's people work informally. No rights, mm. no minimum wage, so, no rule of law. And that's not just in developing countries. So we can do better. We must do better. And it is about full employment. It's about wages that people can live on with dignity. It's about shared prosperity and universal social mm. protection. It, and I was struck by the Chinese uh, student's question because it's also about inclusion and equality, mm. both gender and race. If we don't want to shape the world that we believe rests on our common values, then we will see more of the same. There's a lot in that. There is a lot in that, Pat Conroy, and, and coming into to government during the campaign, of course, Anthony Albanese had talked about delivering for wage earners. But now, of course, he has to face the reality, as he's already said, that wage growth may not keep up with inflation. We are already starting to see the types of inequality that... Um, that Sharon Burrow talked about it. There was a study from University of New South Wales that caught my eye. 130 billionaires in Australia hold as much wealth as the 3 million people in the lowest 30%. How do you deliver for those people that you promised to deliver for? Well, we're, we're delivering right now through a minimum wage increase, for example, which I'll talk about in a minute. But back to the original That's still question. not going to keep pace, I don't think uh, capitalism will destroy democracy, but inequality has that great potential. Mm. If people don't feel like they're invested in a system, why would they care about its existence? And that's what extreme inequality has a potential to do. Uh, at, and obviously, this was a huge issue during the election campaign, and I remember many commentators and political opponents uh, losing it when Anthony Albanese suggested a $1 an hour increase in the minimum wage. But, but now he's admitting, which we have delivered, now he is admitting, which we have admitting that, that wage, ri wage rises can't keep up with inflation. That's likely to be the reality. You're going to have um, this, this jobs uh, and, and, and skills summit. Mm. What are you looking to come out of that? Is well, that the sort of accord that we saw maybe during the, the Hawke-Keating years? How do you deliver on those things? Well, what we're looking for is any constructive suggestions to improve our economic performance. You're absolutely right. We've got a couple of tough years ahead of us in terms of high inflation. Inflation that's been caused mainly by supply chain issues, particularly overseas, and that's why it's so important to diversify our economy and uh, make us a bit more nationally independent from global supply chains so we can withstand those shocks. But the, uh, the, 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 the summit is all about how do we grow skills and productivity in this economy economy. Productivity has been sluggish for too long and productivity in the long term is really how we get economic growth, which means jobs and higher wages. But inequality is something we have to tackle as well. When the people who literally risked their lives during the COVID pandemic, the nurses, the cleaners, the school teachers, when their pay doesn't um, uh, rise, we have a huge issue. It was OK for me to work from home as a politician, but uh, nurses couldn't. Cleaners couldn't, bus drivers couldn't, and yet unless we make sure they're rewarded for their hard effort, mm. that has major implications for our society.